Good afternoon. My name is Brian Basel. I'm with SavingForCollege.com, the Vice President of Research and Development. And today I'm here with Maria Carla to talk about her book, Achieve the College Dream, You Don't Need to Be Rich to Attend a Top School. Thank you very much for joining me today. Thank you really for having me, it. Brian. I'm very excited to be here. It's my pleasure. Um, so could you start by introducing yourself and telling us a little bit about you and your background? Sure. Um, well, I um, never thought, I'm very excited to be here and um, talk to you know parents, um, hopefully and possibly students, it's just counselors, uh, because when I was uh, a student in high school, I never thought that I would be able to attend um, a selective university, let alone the university I ended up attending, um, Harvard, uh, for my undergraduate studies. I was a recent immigrant uh, from Cuba. Uh, my parents had very limited income when we first arrived to South Florida, uh, where um, I now make my home uh, in Miami. And I was determined to go to college because my parents' uh, main reason to bring my sister uh, and me here was to give us the best possible education in the world. But we had no idea how to navigate uh, high school academics, uh, which were the right subjects to take, or which colleges were actually accessible. I had the idea that universities like Harvard um, were out of our reach completely, that I would not never be able to um, get accepted, even if I had strong grades um, and uh, strong extracurriculars, and much less afford them. When uh, I would look at the tuition figures um, online, and I would see um, the costs ascending um, $50,000 a year, $6,000 a year, I would think to myself, my, this, that, that's not even my parents' combined um, income um, annually. How could I ever possibly afford them? Um, but thankfully, with the help of um, you know, guidance counselors and mentors along the way, I was able to uh, not only get admission to Harvard, but other uh, four other Ivy League universities. And when I finally started my, my journey at Harvard, um, I became determined to spread the word about all the opportunities that are available uh, at selective colleges in general for students from all backgrounds, uh, even recent immigrants, even students who are uh, of, you know, have limited income, uh, students who are still learning English, uh, students from all over the world. These universities are very accessible. Uh, in every way. So I began my journey at the Harvard Admissions Office as a recruiter, talking to parents and students, uh, teachers, counselors about the options available there. Um, I uh, went on to the World Bank to work in education, uh, to different universities. Um, and finally, I published uh, my book, Achieve the College Dream, um, um, last year, a few months ago. And in this book, um, I really tried to uh, reach a bigger audience. I'm constantly giving workshops and, and talks at school. Uh, online, uh, but I wanted to reach a bigger audience. I wanted every student who has ever dreamed of a top education to know that they can reach there, that if I did it, they can do it. Uh, so it's a guide that mixes uh, concrete steps that you can follow as early as middle school, uh, even possibly elementary school, um, to prepare for um, for selective universities, even the most selective. But it also uh, tells my story. It tells um, the book shares the tips um, that I personally followed um, as a student in the U.S. to prepare academically uh, to have strong extracurriculars uh, without having to spend a lot of money. Uh, so hopefully it's a guide that will inspire as well as inform and will be a useful tool. It's really an amazing story. That Thank, you. I, Thank you. I think it's completely fascinating. And You know, we keep hearing a lot about the high cost of private universities and how expensive they are and how much the tuition is increasing. Um, but in your book, you contend that you know some of the most expensive, you know, sticker prices on these expensive Ivy League schools can actually be the most affordable for low-income students. Could you talk a little bit more about that? Absolutely. In my case, uh, very few people believe me when I tell them that Harvard was the most affordable option that I had, even more affordable than my um, the my own state schools uh, in Florida, because what very few people realize is that. Uh, most selective universities have very generous financial aid, not even in the form of loans, in the form of grants. They give you money that you don't have to repay based on your income. So they first evaluate the student for admission and once you're in, they start taking into account your family's finances to determine how much they can give you. Uh, and these universities have so many resources, they're so wealthy that they're able to give you 
usually as much as you need to be able to afford a university. Now, that doesn't only include the cost of tuition. Financial aid also covers the cost of living, accommodation, meals, uh, many times even um, you know health insurance and books. Uh, I personally uh, got over $200,000 to attend Harvard. I graduated virtually with uh, no debt. I even got a computer uh, from the university um, to um, do my schoolwork. Uh, other friends uh, would get um, winter clothes, for example, if they, they came from uh, warm um, states with warm weather and they needed the winter clothes. Uh, others got free tickets to school events. The, the universities have, um, they, they want to make sure that if you are accepted, once it's determined that they want you um, um, at the schools, you are able to, to afford them. Um, so there are, there's a tool at um, the websites of most of these universities, the financial aid websites, that is called the net price calculator. Mm -hmm. um, anytime families can go and check out these net price calculators and estimate how much the real cost of attending the university will be for their specific family with their specific circumstances. So don't think that the sticker price, uh, the official tuition figures, is what determines how much that will, will cost you. Very few people do not receive financial aid. Even middle income families who think they will never get financial aid from selective universities, they usually get um, some. And again, uh, most of the financial aid is given in the form of grants or scholarships that don't have to be repaid. And you can even complement that financial aid with private scholarships like I did. I, I have also applied to scholarships uh, from, let's say, um, Toyota or Brandsmart or mm -hmm. Univision. I had a very robust financial aid package that made um, a university that could be um, that always seems uh, unreasonable financially, very, very affordable. Wow. So, so you got a great financial aid package from the school itself, and then you supplemented that with private scholarships that you applied to on your own. Exactly. How did you figure out where to start? Like, it seems really overwhelming for a parent that doesn't know anything about this process. So, so where do you even begin? The most important um, part of the process is picking universities that offer need-based financial aid instead of merit aid. That way you will know that um, you will receive financial aid based on your family income. Uh, another important part is to select universities that have need-blind admission, meaning that they won't discriminate against students who have financial need. And these, usually the universities that are very, they have very generous policies. This is all over their admissions website. So uh, once you select the universities uh, where <clears throat> um, the student is interested in attending, just check to make sure they have need-based financial aid and need-blind um, admission. Um, a good, um, usually a good sign that the university is very affordable is when they have um, almost free tuition for families making uh, less than sixty thousand to sixty-five thousand dollars per year. That's when you know that uh, the university is committed to to access, even for families with the most limited income. Um, and those universities usually have between. Um, for families who make between $60,000 a year and $120,000 a year, they don't require them to pay over 10% of their salaries. So the first step is to check um, the website. Then there are many um, applications out there that you can check for private scholarships. Uh, one that I always recommend is Scholly, um, S-C-H-O-L-L-Y. You can download it on your iPhone uh, and it sends um, um, updates on, financial, on scholarships that are available to you based on the major that, that you're interested in, on your age, etc. Um, the school's counselors all, um, also usually have newsletters that they send. So Scholly.com Scully, you said? Scholly.com. Okay, we'll exactly. add that in. Uh, in the comments Scully. section. Scully.com and Scully, the actual application that you can download um, okay. on your smartphone. Um, and um, school counselors, school districts have newsletters. And by school counselors, you don't mean the financial aid office of the university. You're saying start with your high school counselor. With your high school counselors, mm -hmm. exactly. But at the same time, it's good that you mentioned uh, that, Brian, because many universities, like Georgetown, for example, they have on their financial aid page, they also have um, a section devoted specifically to private scholarships that you can use to supplement um, their, their, um, their financial aid. So you should also check the financial aid websites very thoroughly. Okay, excellent. Um, so since we're talking about uh, financial aid officers and, and folks that are helping you, um, how do you find? This? What should you go to your um, your counselor with? How do you how do you approach your counselor? Um, for a lot of students, um, this seems like a process that you should not start until you're a senior because. Um, uh, you think of senior year as a time to focus on college, but 
um, it's actually too late to start thinking about college. Um, many scholarships have deadlines even you know before senior year starts, for example. Um, and if you're thinking of applying early action to some schools, the deadlines can come as early as October. And if you're starting your school year in August, September, that leaves you very little time. So you should actually introduce yourself to your counselor when you are in ninth grade, when you've just entered the school. Um, that's that's uh, when the counselor will be able to get to know your interests, uh, will be able to offer advice on the kinds of subjects that, that you can pick in high school, the ones that are available to you, and ways to supplement um, that those academics in school. For example, uh, my school uh, didn't offer all the AP classes that I wanted to take. Uh, so my, I went online um, and I took a few courses uh, through Florida Virtual School, but different states have um, you know different online um, schooling that students can take advantage of uh, within the state. Um, or you can do dual enrollment programs uh, at local colleges and universities. I wanted to advance uh, within the math track, for example, so I spent my summers taking math courses so I would be able to take calculus level um, courses when I was a senior. Um, but the kind of awareness that you have to, um, to build to be able to craft a very strong curriculum for college, um, it needs to happen as early as, um, as ninth grade. So it's always good to introduce yourself to counselor, introduce your interests, um, always um, pay a visit, you know, once or twice uh, a month. Uh, remember, uh, remind them that um, that you're there, that you're seeking for opportunities. Uh, that way they'll immediately think of you uh, when a new scholarship, for example, or a new you know, dual enrollment course uh, comes their way. Um, and don't be afraid to seek the advice of admissions officers at the uh, universities. A few people know that Part of, the response, part of the role of an admissions officer, even at the most selective universities, is to guide students to the college. So they will go to different schools to give information sessions, for example, but they're also available to answer your emails, your calls. Uh, we should not be abused, but certainly is, is a resource that is very underutilized. Um, current students at top universities um, uh, are also available um, to help students uh, and parents figure out the way to prepare themselves strategically for the college. I was actually a student recruiter when I was uh, at Harvard working at the admissions office part-time um, and I would receive calls uh, and emails from parents and students every day or give information sessions, campus tours. Um, that information, the content information for the students and the admissions officers are always available um, on the admissions um, office website um, of the different universities. Excellent. So if your school doesn't happen to have, if you feel that your um, college counselor at your high school is not competent or you want to seek additional help, where should where would you where would you start there? That unfortunately happens. Uh, the majority of the public schools, especially, um, sometimes there is one counselor per let's say a thousand students. Uh, that was actually my case. I went to a very large public high school and we had uh, just one college counselor. We were um, um, a lot. Um, I. <clears throat> was very grateful to a guidance counselor from a nearby school who, um, I always say, adopted me uh, when I was a junior. Uh, so I had a good friend from elementary school who had just gotten into Harvard the year before, uh, and the moment I knew that he had been accepted, I, I asked him for, for a meeting, I asked him to, to talk to me and, and just explain to me how it was possible to go to Harvard. That's when I first realized that uh, this kind of education was accessible to someone um, uh, you know, from my community, I to that po I, uh, up to that point, I had never met anyone within my family or my immediate circle of friends or classmates who had attended the Ivy League or similar uh, institutions. And he introduced me to his guidance counselor, uh, who in turn um, shared a wealth of information. She shared tips on how to apply for scholarships, how to craft a good personal statement. That's the essay required to apply to college. Uh, which teachers were the best to get to get letters of recommendation from, and this kind of help is invaluable for many reasons. On the one hand, I mean uh, there is a lot of value in getting expert help to uh, determine the right universities to apply to. In your personal case, I mean there are over four thousand universities in the U.S. So how do you decide uh, which are you know the eight to to thirteen that you should apply to, um, or which topics to pick for your personal statement? When there are so many, uh, but besides the expert advice, uh, what's very valuable, uh, especially for you know in my case. Um, 
um, I didn't have a lot of confidence in, you know, in my ability to reach this kind of education. Um, and having that team behind me, my friend and a guidance counselor, uh, for inspiration, um, that was amazing. So if you have a friend who's gotten into, or someone you know who has gotten into uh, a selective university or a university that you are thinking about, um, it's always good to reach out to them to, to, to take that first step, to knock on the door, um, to ask for all the resources that help that person uh, get into the university. Uh, and surprisingly, there are many counselors who are amazing and very competent in other schools who are willing to share uh, advice with students from other schools. But again, um, also admissions officers at the universities are available to answer questions. I formed a relationship with my admissions officer from Harvard even before I applied because I made sure to attend the information session that she delivered in my community, in my city, when I was a junior. I, met, I waited until the uh, presentation was over. I asked her for her business card. I introduced myself. I brought a copy of my resume. I emailed her afterward. I asked her for feedback on my uh, junior and senior year courses. Wow. And this is all information that, that is kept on a file so when you apply, there already is a history mm -hmm. um, you know, of you as a candidate in the files of the admissions office and your interest is legitimate because you've been communicating with the university uh, for so long. Um, so there are many ways. There are also uh, college prep programs uh, that are available like through organizations like the Posse Foundation, uh, for example. Uh, they are free of charge. They are start as early as ninth grade. Uh, you can do them over the summer, but sometimes you have ongoing support throughout the year. The Bezos Scholar Foundation, the Hamilton um, Scholars, a wealth of programs available at um, city level, state level, and even um, national level. Wow. You know, it really strikes me as we're talking how much you're talking not about online resources but about relationship building and how important all these people were so and having important. this great team is behind you. Um, and you did mention Scully, but are there other online resources or really people should get out there and start handshaking and, and making those uh, those relationships happen? It should be a mix. Uh, it's very important to build strong relationships especially uh, within your community um, I think because um, there are resources like scholarships that are only available uh, to you know, from your specific city, for example. So someone um, from your city might know of a resource that applies to you that someone from, from out of state um, you know, would not know. And it's when you're seeking mentorship, it's always so valuable to have that you know, in-person connection, someone that you can meet with for coffee, mm -hmm. someone that can, um, you know, when I, when I meet with students that I mentor uh, with applications, it's always so enriching to uh, just read the personal statement together and think of ways to, to make it stronger. Um, um, also, I mean, there are um, events or internships or uh, just enrichment opportunities in general that are available to you uh, in your community, and you might not be able to uh, to go outside of the state, you know, to seek for them. So, so the the local networking, the local relationship building, uh, is is very important. But at the same time, there are um, mentorship programs um, um, at a national level uh, online um, that that you can that you can access, uh, you can communicate and build relationships with current students at different universities, uh, and that's extremely valuable. Uh, I always try to connect aspiring college students with current students or recent graduates from different universities, uh, so you can get um, that perspective from someone who um, is going through the through the experience. And you know, it's very hard when you're thinking of a school out of state to to have in person meetings, but even a Skype uh, conference. I sometimes mentor students who are from outside of the country and, and we Skype uh, for example often we have uh, video chats um, anything helps excellent um, for those of you that are just joining us, my name is Brian Bosman, I'm the Vice President of Research and Development here at SanfordCollege.com. I'm talking with Maria Carla about her book Achieve the College Dream, You Don't Need to Be Rich to Attend a Top School um, right. How selective are... Oh, do you have something? No, but let people know that uh, they yeah. should do that's true. If you do have questions, and, and you can probably hear um, my colleague Martha Kordiak is uh, taking questions, so if you do have any questions, please feel free to type into the comments and, uh, and she'll relay them to us and we can hopefully answer them. I also just wanted to mention that the book uh, mentions specific resources, mentorship programs, scholarships, um, college preparatory programs that, that you can access to. So the, all, those, all those lists are available in the book uh, for those of you wanting concrete information, concrete names. And and programs that you want to apply to. Excellent, great tips. Um, so let's talk a little bit about more about getting into the colleges that you want to get into. Um, how selective are the colleges when they're looking for applicants? Um, 
colleges are getting increasingly selective. Uh, the value of higher education in, in the United States is increasing uh, throughout the world. Um, in Asia, for example, there is increasing demand for a spot at our elite um, institutions. Um, and we see students preparing for standardized exams like the SAT and, and the ACT as early as, as middle school. When I applied to college, for example, the, 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 percent, the range of, um, of um, admissions um, percentages at the versus like the Ivy League was between you know 10 and 15 percent uh, right now is between like five and ten percent closer to five okay. uh, so the number of spots available at the different institutions is not increasing but the number of applicants are and there's also a lot more financial aid available and a lot more awareness about the financial aid available. So many families who might have thought that this kind of education was uh, outside their reach now understand that it's, it's actually accessible and affordable. Um, so the, the, the competition is tough. Definitely. So, so the resources are there to actually get in, but you got to fight for it. Yes, yes, exactly. <laughs> now, uh, something that I always like to mention is, even though it's, you can never be certain that you can get into one particular school because of how selective the school is, and there's always an element of subjectivity, right? I mean, you, you might be the same candidate with perfect grades, perfect extracurricular history for, you know, eight... Uh, the eight top schools in the country and you might not get into one or two mm -hmm. even if you were that perfect candidate right but uh, a strong student a strong candidate with the the strong academic uh, curriculum strong extracurriculars um, a compelling personal story um, has over 80 percent of getting accepted into one selective institution uh, so that's the statistic that I, that I like to share uh, because parents usually focus on the five to ten percent parents and students they focus on the how tough it is to get into one particular school, but they don't realize it's actually, I mean, if you follow, um, um, you know, a rigorous plan, um, hopefully, you know, some of, some of that I share, that's the plan that I share in the book. If you follow the steps, then you, you can definitely uh, be admitted, have a certainty that you can be admitted into a selective institution. Okay, so if I'm the perfect student, you know I've got a 4.0, I'm doing great, I've got all A pluses, what are those other things that they're looking mm -hmm. for right. that, so, that they'll get me that they can get me in? Strong academics is just the bare minimum that we have to ensure, right? So we are applying to academic institutions. So we do have, even if we ha if we are great leaders and uh, we have a great personal story and curriculars, we have to guarantee that we have our strong academics. That means that we're taking high level subjects in the four main academic areas, which are English, social studies, natural sciences, and math right at the highest possible level meaning IB advanced placement or you know the Cambridge program um, you know eight levels um, as early as ninth grade so students who prioritize the um, GPA for example over the subjects they're at, at a disadvantage um, so universities prefer a B in an AP class for example than an A in an honors class of course in an ideal scenario we would have an A in an, a, in an AP class um, <laughs> But besides the GPA and the um, strategic courses, uh, we need strong standardized test scores um, in the SAT between 600 and 800 in every section, including SAT subject tests, and over 30 on the ACT. Now, there are many students with perfect grades and scores uh, who don't get into top universities because universities are increasingly trying to form leaders who will have a positive impact on society, right? They're taking the mission very seriously. So if you're someone who's only interested in your academics and you're going to the university to absorb the knowledge, but they don't see how you will apply it in a way that will improve society in a way, even though it sounds cliche, it's something that, that universities take very seriously, um, you have a lower chance of admission. So you have to demonstrate, besides your academics, that you are planning to use your education for a good purpose. And they look at your extracurricular history in high school and even before to understand what are your interests and passions and, and your goals. Um, now, that's tricky because a lot of parents and students interpret that as, I have to fill my resume with a million activities and leadership positions. and when you do that, it's very difficult to actually devote a significant amount of time and energy to, to one or two activities that you're truly passionate about. And universities are increasingly, um, you know, they, they are experts at um, noticing when a student has just tried to um, fill a resume instead of really uh, committing to, to one or two interests. So uh, it's important that you show leadership 
commitment to to your passions, whatever they are. It's not true that university have a preference for, let's say, like arts, like a musical instrument or a sport. You can have very unique interest in other fields, like you know, robotics, or uh, maybe it's um, um, you know a particular uh, subject uh, like science, and then you're. Uh, you take it to the next level and you're going to science olympiads um, and you are teaching science or you're doing scientific research. Uh, it's, it's very easy to see when someone is so passionate about a field or an activity that you're always finding ways to devote more time to it or to scale your participation. So always find, find ways to uh, do good through that interest or activity, to scale your leadership, to involve others, um, and um, and use your time productively and use your resources. Universities uh, will never judge you negatively if you didn't take advantage of resources that were outside of your reach. So when you think of students who are you know, building schools in other countries or um, they, they have this very impressive social histories, don't feel like you, you um, will be at a disadvantage if you didn't have access to them. You know, like I, I personally didn't. Um, my activities in high school were, you know, as president of the math club, I was, um, I loved math competitions. I was always competing um, at the you know, local and, and state and national level. Um, that's something that I loved. And I loved um, service. So through the Kiwanis organization, through Peak Club, um, I was always participating in activities uh, like, um, for example, um, horseback riding therapy for children with disabilities or um, we would spend the weekends at nursing homes uh, um, entertaining the residents. They were very different but I was very passionate about it uh, and about the math club. Uh, so those were my two. And college access. Um, I, was, I was always trying, to, like I'm doing now, I was always trying to guide other students to college because I had personally found it so difficult. So I would interview students that I um, had met who had gone to top universities and ask them how they did it and then I would um, spread their stories through newsletters for students and parents. Also in Spanish, I went to a, uh, to a school with a significant Spanish-speaking population. Um, but I think what was important was to convey um, that I had a lot of passion for the, the two or three activities that I was pursuing very seriously. Well, my neighbors will be really excited to hear that the Kiwanis contributed to you. Uh, De to your yes, game. <laughs> so much. They act I actually just uh, had an interview with the Kiwanis magazine and was just sharing how Key Club had been so instrumental in preparing me for college. So definitely. <laughs> so was it less? So when I applied for college way back when, um, <laughs> it was more of a focus on having a well-rounded background and doing lots of things and kind of making sure you checked off everything on the list. But it sounds like that's not the case anymore, and you really want to focus on one or two things and really do them well and show that you're devoted and have achieved something. Is that fair to say? Right. I mean, there isn't one particular formula, right? There's There are um, students who are so passionate about school spirit and they have numerous positions in different school organizations and so you will have resume with many different activities that's totally fine and, and then there are other students who will focus on their band or uh, the newspaper or research that's fine too um, don't don't think of it as a um, um, as, as a formula, um, as a number of activities, uh, I think of it as pursuing your passions and giving yourself enough time to really be devoted to, to activities. But it's definitely not, there isn't a checklist. Um, right, there are many schools that require service hours, for example, um, to, for students to graduate. So that will, all, that will usually be something that you will have to check just because of the graduation requirement. Uh, but many students uh, choose to do something that they're not passionate about, uh, something that will classify a service, um, I don't know, organizing books at the school library. Some, some students might enjoy that, and it's definitely <laughs> something of, of, of worth, but if you don't enjoy organizing books uh, in the shelves in your school library, there is no reason why you should spend your time you know, doing that. So um, I, what's most important is that there is, there is coherence, uh, that colleges can read your essay, your letters of recommendation, um, can get the feedback from your alumni interview, and think this makes sense. I mean, it's, it, this is, it is very clear that this student has a passion for X and Y, that the student has taken advantage of all the resources available to him or her to develop um, you know, that interest further, right? So um, that's why it's, it's not um, clever to um, think about when you're writing an essay, for example, why would colleges want you to, to write or follow another student's um, you know, recipe for success because you're trying to be unique. 
um, that's that's you're trying to find your voice you're trying to devote um, develop your own interests your own skills and the only way to be unique is when you are when you're true to 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 those interests so do you think are, are students at a disadvantage if they don't come from a unique background and have that unique story like if they're not a, if they're not a Cuban immigrant if they are you know a Midwestern white boy you know middle of the <laughs> middle of the country um, are they at a disadvantage then when they go to apply how do they how do they distinguish themselves no, actually, I mean, I thought that I was not unique because there were so many Cuban immigrants uh, <laughs> in my community. I'm, I live in, in South Florida, um, so um, they're definitely not a disadvantage. In fact, even if you come from the same school, uh, some students think that uh, colleges will only uh, pick one or two students from one school at most. Uh, that's not true. There's so many ways to distinguish yourself, you know. Um, maybe that this Midwestern boy like has... Uh, um, literary interests are very unique but you just never thought that they were interesting enough or or you know worth mentioning um, maybe you have uh, you've had a band your entire life but because it's not a formal organization you don't think it's worthwhile to mention it but you spend hours practicing with your band um, every week maybe you've collected you've had a, a, a unique collection of something whatever that is uh, for your entire life and and that collection has sparked an interest in anthropology or, or archaeology uh, for example um, I, I think um, we we all have more interesting stories than we like to think it's just sometimes it's hard to distinguish what makes us unique and that is why it's so important to find that mentorship to find the guidance from um, from other students who have got into college so you can see the kinds of, um, of, of, of unique attributes that you would bring to the community always um, when I'm trying to mentor students and guide them through the topics for the personal statement and helping them think of why they're unique, um, I ask them to place themselves within their circle of friends. Why do friends come to you for? What, what do you bring to your circle of friends or to your school community that um, the rest of your friends, you know, don't? Or what, why, what do they appreciate about you that you might not have noticed before? Um, and that usually um, gives us, you know, one or two good ideas to start with. Something else that a lot of uh, students don't consider is you, there are some students who legitimately can't participate in many extracurriculars or don't have, um, uh, uh, you know, don't have the time, don't have the resources to, to stay after school, to participate in sports or organizations because they, they have to work. A lot of students have to work or they have to care for a sibling or they lack transportation and they have to go home and live very far. When that is the case and you feel like you, you have very strong academics, you are a go-getter, you have this passion um, for academics and you really see yourself in that um, institution, what you have to do is explain the circumstances unique to you that didn't enable you to be as active as you would have wished during your high school. So whether it was you know working part time or having to care for siblings or uh, any of that, there's always a space in the application and during the interview to explain that. And the letters of recommendation from your teachers can support um, that information as well. So don't be, that's very, very important. Always explain your unique circumstances because any achievement, if you had to overcome any uh, obstacles, if you had limited uh, uh, income to uh, put towards your education or your activities, uh, if you come from a single parent household, if you have to help your, your parents with the family business, the universities want to see that and they'll take that into consideration to judge anything that you were able to do. Okay, and they fa they'll factor that into the financial aid package always, as well. Always, always. Well, the, yeah, sometimes if, if um, uh, it impacts your need, mm -hmm. it impacts your income, definitely. Uh, for those of you just joining us, I'm talking to Maria Carla, author of Achieve the College Dream. Um, and it sounds like we have some questions, Martha. Yeah, related to financial aid, can you negotiate financial aid awards? Can you negotiate financial awards? Absolutely. Um, so what this means is if, for example, you're applying to different universities and one gave you a more generous financial aid package than another, can you um, go to other universities and can you tell them this is the financial aid package that I got um, at, from this institution, could you match it? Or if, let's say you have, you just want to negotiate with one university, um, can you bring the, 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 the price um, down even further? Absolutely. Uh, there are different ways to do it. There are some universities, uh, even uh, universities within the Ivy League, like you know Cornell and Dartmouth. Like they open in their websites, they say if you receive a financial aid package at another from another comparable institution uh, that is more generous, we'll match it. 
Mm-hmm. So always be on the lookout for specific financial aid policies from the universities because it might be easier than you think. It might just be a matter of bringing a more general financial aid package and, um, um, and, and, and having them match it. On the other hand, uh, some universities don't might not take into account all the different elements of your unique financial situation. So let's say uh, if I don't know if, if a parent loses employment after you submitted the application, uh, or the salary went down, or someone in your family became ill and you have new healthcare expenses. Um, if there are significant financial changes. Um, in your within your family environment from the time you submit the application and you receive a response you should always update the university um, and sometimes you don't think that um, an information might impact the financial package but it might so it's always good to earn the side of providing a lot more um, facts about your your family's finances um, than than not and the financial aid officers are humans, right? You can actually have a conversation with them. They're there to guide you. They're usually assigned to specific students. So don't be afraid to pick up the phone and contact them. That's part of their job. You can have a normal conversation with them uh, and be um, you know, very frank about your situation. Um, there have been times when universities ha- have announced generous financial aid policies, like families should not pay more than 10% of their income, right? But when you um, check your financial aid package, you realize it's actually um, um, more than your the, the, the promised 10%. Um, so you can actually hold your school accountable um, to that information. You can you know bring uh, that publication that has actually uh, guided some students um, you know through the strategy, and it has worked. Uh, universities you know take that very seriously, and sometimes there are mistakes, right? Because it's the the, the humans are behind the calculations. <laughs> so always be on top of the financial aid package. Um, understand uh, which which are the sources of aid. It's not you know getting a loan is not the same as getting as getting a grant. Right, uh, so always, um, always push uh, to get the best possible financial aid package. There's one chapter in the book, um, actually, that's solely devoted to getting financial aid uh, from the universities, and there are some tips also for negotiation with the universities. So just like going out to eat, you want to make sure you check that bill and that everything yes. matches up, right? Yes, yes. You don't want to be overpaying for that those exactly. fries you didn't order. Exactly, and that bill can be very intimidating. So I'm also making sure I included a lot of financial aid terms uh, in the glossary just to, to guide the parents and. Students students through through what it might mean. Okay. How, how are we doing? Okay, we've got a few other questions if you'd like to take them. Yeah, let's, let's take some questions. All right. Um, how does the major you choose affect your admissions chances? Mm, um, it depends on the university. Usually it does not affect your admissions chances. Um, it helps when your major is consistent with your school history. So let's say if you um, had very strong academics, particularly in the in one subject area. But then your major is in something completely different. The universities will wonder, well, then why why did the student you know not pick very strong courses in this area throughout high school? Mm-hmm. Um, so they will think that you are uh, you know experimental. You haven't really thought about uh, the major, um, and it's usually true that um, it helps to select. Um, an, a major on the application, an expected major, than to um, define yourself as undecided, right? Because it shows that you at least have, you know, given some thought to the kind of education that you want to pursue in the university. That said, the universities will not hold you accountable for that major. They know that the vast majority of students change majors uh, throughout college, That's for uh, sure, right? more than once, actually. Like I, for example, was convinced that I was going to be pre-law, and I started off as an economics major. After my freshman year, um, I was in, I switched to history and literature, and I ended up in history when I was a junior, actually. Um, and universities make it very easy to switch majors. Private, uh, selective universities have better structures in, in place to eliminate a lot of the bureaucracy that goes into switching majors, so that's something that you should keep in mind. I mean, usually when you are in a um, you know, bigger school, it might be more difficult, but you know, I, I switched majors in one day um, after I, I decided it. Um, but just just to conclude, it 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 doesn't matter which major you pick, um, but they will they, there should be some consistency with your with your high school history, um, and you should have the grades to prove that you can perform strongly in that major that mm-hmm. you declare once you go to college. Excellent. Other questions? Uh, here's another one. How many backup schools should you have when applying? 
Ooh, the safety school question. That's a right? great question. Um, it's it's very interesting to see that students sometimes apply to like one reach or you know dream or selective school, and the rest are backups. Or you know students who apply to one backup and the rest are um, very very selective schools. So there always needs to be a balance. I usually recommend that families pick between um, eight and thirteen um, schools. Uh, all of them should be of interest to the student. All of them should be appealing, meaning that they should offer the majors and the kind of college experience that you're looking for and that means different things for different students there's one chapter in the book that's solely devoted to the kinds of factors that you should consider when you're um, conforming your um, you from your college list uh, and they range from academics to you know personal interests extracurriculars location financial aid of course whatnot but once you find um, schools that you're interested in you should narrow them down uh, 8 to 13 is a, is a good number and at least you know three should be backups um, and I would say no more than a, a three to four should be should be reached and the way to determine when some schools are you know which school is a safety versus a, a peer or a reach is by looking at the student profiles the, the admitted student profile um, of the different universities so when you log on to the when you visit the websites of the different universities um, um, you should always look for student profile and that will tell you the average um, GPAs, the average standardized test scores of the students that the school admits. You can compare them to your own and that way you can see uh, what would be your likelihood of acceptance at the different universities. So um, it's very important to note that for some students um, a reach might not be you know, a reach for other students, right? Mm -hmm. uh, or what is a backup to you might not be a backup for other students. So always, you know, don't compare um, yourself to, to others, only compare yourself to other, other students that you know in your school, for example. Always look at the student profile, compare yourself to the admitted students uh, from the school because the you will determine whether, some, whether one is reach or safety based on your unique scores. Wow, it's, that's amazing. Uh, it's funny because I was actually rejected from my safety school, but accepted to my, my top pick. So <laughs> that's some good advice. And you said how many how many schools should we be applying to? Between 8, um, 13. I mean, some students, they have um, even you know an error list. Uh, they're fine with, with 6, for example. I would never recommend applying to fewer than 5, mm -hmm. um, you know, just in case. Um, because it can happen. You can get rejected by your safety school, for example. That happens more frequently than uh, a lot of people think because universities don't want to be rejected. They have something very precious that they call the yield, which is how many students from the ones they accept, accept them in return, and they don't want to hurt that figure because it's part of their um, marketing. So if they think that you won't go to the school, even if they give you a strong financial aid package, if you're um, a student that um, you know has grades and scores that are way beyond the uh, the scores and the grades of the average admitted student, that school uh, might actually reject you. So the yield is unaffected. Well, that's, that's good to know. And it can be very demoralizing to get those rejection letters too. Do you have any advice for people that are actually going through the admissions process and they're just waiting for those letters to come back and what they should be expecting or doing once they get those letters? Um, there are you know, several different strategies. If you apply through the early admission program, so there's early action and early decision, um, I also, in the book, I explain the difference between the two and I offer advice on uh, you know, when to pick one versus the other. Uh, you should usually hear back from universities uh, around December of your senior year. So that gives you plenty of time to apply to other schools in the regular admission cycle, but also to appeal, um, you know, in a way, your, your early response. So you can actually write to the admissions committee and you can update them on your, on your application. You can ask for feedback on why uh, you were not um, you know, admitted during that first round and sometimes they're very candid and they tell you, for example, well, our, we don't think that your scores uh, were really up to par you know, with our expectations and you can, then you have time to prepare yourself to retake the ACT or the SAT um, in the remainder of the year. Uh, you can submit additional letters of recommendation uh, if they complement your application. So it's always, it's always um, good not to bombard the admissions committee with you know, excessive information, but if there is important information, uh, new merits, new scores, new grades uh, that you have, you can always um, send those updates. And there are many schools that have deadlines that are um, a lot later than 
the usual early and regular admission calendar. Uh, so later than, than January of your senior year, uh, some schools accept applications even uh, up to the summer before you start college, June and July. Uh, so always check for that. And in the worst case scenario, you end up in a school that you're not particularly happy about. You can make sure you perform very strongly. You get those A's. You build your, your leadership in your first year of college, and then you can transfer um, to another institution uh, following a very similar process. Great, great tips. Um, again, I'm talking with Maria Carla about her book, the Achieve the College Dream. You don't need to be rich to attend a top school. Um, Martha, how, how are we doing on uh, questions? Um, good. You can continue. You can keep uh, going? Yeah. Excellent. Mm -hmm. um, so what should students really start thinking about when they're actually picking a school? Can you, like you said, there's thousands of universities out there, and it can be really overwhelming to say, okay, now I have to start picking them and applying to them, and it takes time to apply, and it can be a very overwhelming process. So where would they start when, when it's actually, you know, you've, you've, you've done your activities, you've got your scores <laughs> up, now it's time to go figure out where you're gonna go. I think it's important to remember that you're not only going to college to study. You know, it's actually part of your life. So whatever you attend, it has to be consistent with the kind of life that you enjoy. Because if you're unhappy outside of your academics, uh, with your environment, that's likely to affect how you're doing academically and, and, and affect the college experience overall. And college can be the most special time of your life. You want to make sure that with so many options available, you're picking the ones that are right for you individually. What's right for you might not be what's right for everyone else and, and vice versa. So it's good to have that, um, you know, to follow that very individual thought process to, to, to pick your choices. Uh, so first, I would think very deeply about what kind of environment I want in college. Um, do I want to be in a very large or mid-size or small college? Do I want an urban versus a rural setting or a suburban area? Uh, what about the weather? Do I mind, you know, cold weather or very warm weathers? Uh, am I a person who loves, you know, outdoors? And will I really miss, uh, you know, being being outside and um, doing different sports uh, if I'm in a college that it's not very outdoorsy? Um, are there any particular activities that I want to do while I'm in college? If, for example, I'm a I'm a serious athlete, uh, it, will there be a team um, that Will um, that will have me at the college? Um, in terms of academics, um, are my majors offered? The majors that I'm thinking about are they offered? And if I decide that I don't like uh, the major for whatever reason, are there other appealing choices uh, at the school with professors that I would enjoy, um, you know, working with? <clears throat> Some students. Um, think that they have very particular academic interests, for example, in engineering and technology, so they pick institutes of technology. Uh, but once they're there and they want to switch to another area, they realize they don't particularly like um, you know, engineering or uh, compulsory physics for everyone in calculus, um, you don't really have the flexibility of a liberal arts curriculum to, to move around. Or if maybe you thought you wanted to go into business and you're going to a business-only school, there are some schools that are focused pretty much exclusively on business and entrepreneurship, but then you realize that you, you want to study engineering. Um, so you have, if you're someone who's undecided, you should look at the curriculum. That's something that's, um, that's not, um, I, I think, um, parents and students should give a lot more thought to the kind of curriculum at the different universities besides the um, the ranking, for example. Am I someone who, who needs a more flexible academic environment and time to make a decision? Uh, so a liberal arts curriculum would be a better fit, or am I so sure of my of my field of interest that I can go into a more specialized, um, like an art school or um, or an engineering school or an institute of technology or <clears throat> or, an, or a business school, for example. So uh, that within academics is very important to look at the curriculum and the majors are offered. Um, but the financial aid can also make a big difference. Um, there are schools that offer very similar curricula and courses and experiences, but have very different financial aid um, policies. The difference between a, a loan-based financial aid package and a no loans financial aid package can make a big difference and some schools prefer one uh, offer one versus um, the other uh, but there's a long list of things to consider and that's why the the college search should start as early as ninth grade um, there are many ways to facilitate that search for example colleges have um, um, fly-in programs, uh, especially for students uh, that have a more limited income. They actually fly the student uh, to campus for a, a, a week-long or a weekend-long program. Uh, the students are able to visit classes, to um, uh, engage with students, professors, to really see themselves 
uh, on campus if they were to enroll uh, full time. Um, and the book offers a list of, of the, some of the flying programs that are available as early as sophomore and junior years. There are also summer programs that you can attend even at you know the Ivy League and, and other uh, top institutions. A lot of them are free. MIT, for example, has excellent free summer programs for high school students. Um, and that's a way to um, <clears throat> to explore uh, in a much in a way that's a lot more real uh, what your life would be like to to really envision that to to test the environments and even to visit nearby schools. It's good to do um, college tours as well if possible. It's not a requirement, but if you do visit schools, it's always good to mention that in the application um, and in in the interview and and to try to meet with current students and admissions officers uh, when you're there. Um, some families go in the summer because it's more convenient. The you know the students don't have to miss classes, but it's actually better to go during the school year if you can arrange that and that way you're seeing um, you know the school, the students in action, the professors in action. You can really see what life is like on a regular school day uh, in the college versus the summer. That can be tremendously helpful. Yes. Um, questions? Yeah, from Trisha Teason, um, going back to the admissions discussion, she asked, do colleges see the other schools you're applying to? Um, that is a controversial practice that has been gradually eliminated. Uh, some colleges used to ask you, where else are you applying on the application? Um, that's actually not allowed, um, and you should um, not feel compelled to, to answer that question, uh, especially at the graduate level. It's, it's uh, rarely seen in undergraduate admissions, but at the graduate uh, level it's still seen. Um, you don't have to answer that. Um, they might know. Um, <laughs> because uh, different admissions officers at different schools do communicate um, and there are some programs for example that if um, um, you know for example the, the Posse Foundation uh, you have to pick uh, a number of schools and the schools might know where else you are um, applying which other schools you're considering but in general they don't they don't need to know what are the pros and cons of them knowing or not knowing well they might know for example if you're considering them um, you know a a safety versus a reach if you have a preference for another school. So if they think for whatever reason that you won't um, attend their institution, if they admit you, they're less likely to, to give you an offer, mm -hmm. um, for example. And um, uh, they might also, uh, this is this collusion is you know, usually done, but if they do know where else you're applying, they might communicate with admissions officers at the other university and 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 one of them can decide, can can communicate with the other and say, I will admit the student, so you don't need to, to admit them, and you can admit another one, you know, that's applying to both. And, but that is a practice that is not usually done. Right, uh, it sounds anymore. like it's only to your detriment to do it then. <laughs> exactly, okay. exactly. So th there shouldn't be no fear about this at all. Gotcha. Other questions? One other audience question from Terry Slater. What is the best way to find what schools offer your intended major? They're very... Um, <clears throat> very useful tools online uh, that, that you can start with. Um, for example, the College Board has a, has a search um, tool that you can use. You um, enter your major and they give you a list of institutions that offer that major. Um, always be cautious and check the website of the university to make sure that um, you know, it's it's up. It's, the information is um, up to date. That the major is still being offered, um, and also be careful when you compare majors because one major can mean something completely different at another institution, uh, or um, whether for one institution the major can be a main focus of their academic curriculum. For another school, it might be not a very popular major. So at one school, you can have more than ten professors devoted to that major and in the school you might have you know two or three and that can make a big difference in the, in the number of courses available to you within the major in the number of professors available to assist with research or to mentor you on a thesis uh, for example um, and that translates into professional opportunities so it's always good to look at the differences between um, the majors at the different universities um, I also recommend, with a grain of salt, the rankings uh, lists. Uh, for example, U.S. News um, and other publications, they offer a list of top 10 universities uh, that offer you know, X major and Y major. Um, they are good as a preliminary um, search strategy, but many students um, or and parents 
follow uh, these rankings uh, too seriously and they don't realize that the rankings are not telling you which are the best schools for your specific circumstance. I mean, the major is not, like we were talking about the different factors that you take into account when um, um, creating your college list. The major is just one of them, right? Um, uh, it doesn't take into account the, the financial aid policies, the, the general environment, um, the, the kind of students that attend the school. So um, use it to guide your search, but it should not, I mean, it's not the ultimate truth. Very good. We have time for one more? Yeah, absolutely. All right. From Robert Kirtland, what impact does the college interview have on an admission to a highly selected school? Do you have tips regarding the interview process? That's a great question. So usually uh, interviews won't you know, make or break an application, right? Um, they are a great part of the application because the process can feel very distant and cold at times. It's, uh, you know, you're you're just submitting an online application. How can you really convey the person you are and, and have an in-person um, uh, interaction with the university, especially if you haven't visited uh, the school or you're not familiar with it? Um, so, so it's great to have uh, a representative from the school to, you know, talk to you and really engage in conversation and you can show your, your social skills. <clears throat> the majority of selective universities um, offer uh, interview on an optional basis. Uh, when you do have the option, you should take advantage of it. Uh, take advantage of, of, of the chance to shine and to support everything that you have um, um, represented in your application. So usually you will have um, alumni from the university that live in your local area meet with you um, individually. Uh, for you know, from half an hour to an hour and a half at the socially center time, and it's an informal discussion. The students could, should use it to to um, learn more about the university, about the experience of the interviewer as a student in the university, uh, and to make it into a conversation, not a formal you know question and answer sessions, right? Uh, and mostly, what the what the interviewer is looking for is just uh, proof that what was represented in the application is right. You are the person you said you wear, right? Um, so some tips uh, is to really study your application, to, to be able to defend uh, your resume, uh, talk about the interest that you express through your personal statement and there's recommendation. Uh, ev everything has to be coherent. The, the story has to um, you know, make sense uh, in a way. And be um, always know that you're being evaluated, of course, so there's an element of formality. I mean, you should be dressed appropriately, you should be on time, um, Not you shouldn't dress up really formal, you know, with, you know, you should, it's not a, a business interview, but you should not be wearing shorts or flip-flops or, or tank tops. Uh, um, but at the same time, it's it could be a more relaxed uh, setting. I had wonderful conversations with my interviewers when I was applying to college. Uh, I asked them a bunch of questions about um, the local university network, from the different schools, uh, the majors they had studied, um, what they had um, done during during their years, um, and you know, unless you do it, like you show up late, uh, you perform really badly in the interview, um, it should not uh, be detrimental to you. And the majority of the interviewers, they're rooting for you. They want you to get in. Um, it's it's wonderful when they can say, I interviewed the student, the, inter the student got admitted, especially if uh, the student is from the local community, the same as uh, the interviewers, because that means that there's more representation of the community at the university. So always go to the interview thinking that this is the person that wants to help me, and I think that does wonders uh, you know, for, your, <laughs> for your mind and, and your approach to the interview. Got it, good tips. Any other questions? I think we're approaching the end of our hour. Um, again, this has been Maria Carlet, author of Achieve the College Dream. Thank you very much for joining me today. It's been a pleasure. Thank you. It's been my pleasure. Thank you all for tuning in. So if people have more questions, what's the best way to, uh, to reach you? Can Great. Well, they can uh, visit my personal website, which is mcchicuen.com, uh, M-C-C-H-I-C-U-E-N.com. There's a contact form. Okay. Um, also, um, if you leave comments uh, on, on this window, on the Facebook page, under the video, I'm more than happy to, to log in and, and follow up with you later on. And you can um, access the book uh, through roman.com. Um, there's actually a special uh, 20% discount that we will be sharing through the, the comments section um, as well. Excellent. And of course, if you have any questions, you're always welcome to interact with us at forum.savingforcollege.com or see me directly at brian at savingforcollege.com. 
Thank you all very much for joining us today. It's been a pleasure to have you. Thank you very much. Thank you, Brian. Have and, a great uh, day. And thank you all very much for attending. Thank you.